What's up everyone, Mark here and welcome to another episode of Down the Road. Today we're talking about an iconic Rhode Island landmark and arguably the defining element of the Providence skyline. Affectionately referred to locally as the Superman Building, the Art Deco skyscraper at 111 Westminster Street in downtown Providence has gone by a number of different names throughout the years, both official and colloquial, from the Industrial Trust Building to the Fleet Bank Building and later the Bank of America Building. In fact, if you've ever watched Family Guy, then you've seen it and might not have even known. Growing up in Warwick, about five miles outside of Providence, I remember being no more than six or seven when I discovered that I could look across my neighbor's yard and see the faint silhouette of the Providence skyline on a clear day. But it was really dusk that I was most excited about. Whenever possible, I'd stay outside playing just a little bit longer to watch the lights of the city turn on. To me, represented by the bright orange strip along the roofline of One Financial Plaza, and the inviting but mysterious soft greenish glow of the beacon atop the Industrial National Bank building. Before we continue, I just want to take a minute to thank you all so much for your support of my channel and for watching today's video. If you're new here or just haven't subscribed yet, then go ahead and take a second to do it now. Just click the red button down below or the watermark over in the corner, and when you do, make sure you tap the bell icon so you get a notification every time I release a new video. Your subscription means the world to me, and it really helps me grow the channel. I truly hope to continue making videos that'll make you want to stick around, but you can always change your mind later. And to all of my existing subscribers, as well as those of you just subscribing today, again, thank you. Getting back to today's story, the Industrial National Bank got its start in 1886 with a location on Custom House Street, ending that year holding about $60,000 in assets, which would be worth about one and three quarter million dollars as of 2021. Fewer than 10 years later, the bank had grown more than a hundredfold, with $6 million in assets worth more than $190 million today. It was in 1894 that the bank moved several blocks south to a much larger and more posh building on Empire Street. And that would suffice for more than three decades. But by 1927, the bank had outgrown that home too, and began planning for a grand new headquarters that would be both the jewel of the city and a monument to capitalism. Shifting a few blocks north, closer to their original location, the bank moved into the new industrial trust tower in 1928 with more than $100 million in assets that would be worth nearly $1.5 billion today. Commissioned by the bank and designed by the New York architectural firm of Walker & Gillette, the new tower was 26 stories tall, 428 feet or 130 meters high, making it at the time of its construction the tallest building in the state of Rhode Island and the third tallest building in New England. In fact, as of 2021, the building remained the tallest in the state, despite lowering to the position of 28th tallest in New England since its opening. Though each one was unique, similarly Art Deco styled skyscrapers were becoming a popular addition to major cities across the country in the early part of the 20th century. Many cities had strict zoning laws requiring setbacks, designs that got progressively narrower as the building rose in height, allowing sufficient light and air to reach the city streets below. Although Providence didn't have this restriction, the same stepped massing reminiscent of those buildings was still chosen for its appealing design aesthetic. Clad in Indiana limestone with deer isle granite along the base, the building consists of six sections arranged symmetrically around a central tower, topped with a large, lighted cupola structure. Each section itself taking the form of a separate, smaller tower conjoined to its neighbors. The design was unusual at the time for a bank, or for any office building for that matter, in that it was open to the street on two opposite-facing sides of the building with an identical facade on each, bearing carved seals of the city and state. In addition to the seals, a number of carved friezes adorn the building's base. The friezes tell the story of the birth and growth of Rhode Island, as well as the birth and growth of local industry. Over the Exchange Street facade, five panels depict stonemasons, native people, Roger Williams' arrival, and the signing of the charter. Along the Arcade Street side are six carvings depicting the activities of sustenance and commerce, hunting, ironworking, fishing, trapping, farming, and shipping. Above the Westminster Street facade, five more panels depict foundry workers making a cannon, a primitive grist mill, a steamship, and women spinning thread. Rhode Island was one of the birthplaces of the textile and garment industry, so it was this very thing that had helped propel the bank to such great success. Inside, the artistic details and craftsmanship abound. The lobby features more friezes of famous Rhode Islanders from Roger Williams, First Governor William Coddington, to Nathaniel Green, Samuel Slater, Gilbert Stewart, and more. The domes from which the main hall chandeliers hang are decorated with images depicting the days of the week, the four winds, the four seasons, and the signs of the zodiac and months, each appearing in concentric rings. Even the tops of the columns in the lobby are designed with buffalo nickel medallions, so you can't forget you're in a bank. The banking hall had a total of 40 teller windows spread across 21,000 square feet, 
or 1,950 square meters. And any bank customer could use any teller window. Prior to this, it was common for teller windows to be segregated by the first letter of your last name. Remember, in these days, there were no computers or ATM cards, and every single transaction had to be conducted through a teller using paper records and forms. In addition to being beautiful to look at, the Industrial Trust Tower was a technological marvel for its time. On the day of the opening, the Providence Journal featured a special pullout section dedicated to the new building. The several page spread served both to fuel public excitement for the structure and to advertise for anyone all who would stake a claim to being part of its construction or outfitting. The New England Telephone and Telegraph Company provided 32 switchboards operating nearly 700 telephones, more telephones than existed in all of Providence only 50 years prior. The Otis Elevator Company provided 14 separate elevators servicing the various floors, capable of traveling at 800 feet per minute a speed that's been more than doubled in modern times, but was record-breakingly fast in its day. Gorham Manufacturing provided the bronze work. Everybody from the steel fabricators to the security firm to the moving company contracted by the bank placed ads associating themselves with the building. Bringing the tower into existence was only a part of the challenge, though. As beautiful and modern as the building was, the problem then was very much the same as it is now, actually filling it. Developers build it as the business building for building business. Initially, office and suite rentals were being advertised in lavish full-page spreads in the newspaper, boasting of the lantern atop the building and likening it to a sign for your business visible from 40 miles around. Although objectively successful, the building's occupancy rate was never quite what the developers had hoped. By just a year after its opening, the detailed and illustrated ads had shrunk to just a few lines of text in the classified section. Speaking of the lantern, it's perhaps the most striking and unique feature of the building. Originally, four 500-pound limestone eagles encircled the top of the cupola, where they appeared to be holding up a large metal globe in the center. The building was an obvious magnet for lightning, and each time it was struck, more damage was done to the eagles. In 1932, a sizable chunk of one even fell to the alley below, fortunately in the middle of the night and not hurting anyone, but just barely missing a parked car with people in it. Repairs were made over and over for almost 20 years before in 1950, the eagles were removed and the metal structure modified and repaired. The only remnant of the eagles still visible today are the unrecognizable lower halves of their bodies from the chest down, carved into the top of the structure itself like a frieze. As architecturally interesting as the cupola and its iconic beacon are, the reality is that it was simply a clever way to disguise the building's chimney. Throughout its occupancy, the building was heated by the same giant oil-fired boilers in the basement. In order to vent the exhaust, what is essentially a large steel smokestack was constructed rising up from the basement all the way through the building's center to vent out through the globe at the top. The top of the globe, once a complete dome of interwoven steel strips, has deteriorated with time too. Today the portion over the chimney has been removed, leaving only a small amount of the original globe structure in a ring surrounding the chimney stack. Although the cupola looks mostly square from the ground, on closer inspection you can tell that it's actually more cylindrical in shape as it conforms to the vent pipe at its center. The mythos surrounding a number of the building's features have sparked debate over the years, not the least of which is the secret room visible on the roof of what would be the 28th floor. A little confusing, as the highest occupied floor in the building was the 26th, which was taken up entirely by the bank president's office suite. Access to the room is exclusively through a fire stairwell off the rear exit of the suite. Up two flights is a door marked 29th level penthouse. Through it and to the left is an incongruous looking porthole door punched through an exterior wall at what is the equivalent of the 29th floor of the building. On the other side is a peculiar room sitting on a portion of the building's roof. To the left and right of the entrance are closets, one containing a liquor and wine cabinet, the other a wet bar accessible for service from outside the room. Panoramic windows surround the exterior facing three sides, and an identical porthole door to the outside sits about a foot off the ground directly across from the room entrance. Through that door exists only a narrow sliver of space up to a railing along the edge of the roof. To see it from the exterior, and indeed the interior, people often say the room looks like a train car, a diner, or the gondola of an airship. The reality is that it does resemble all of those things, and frustratingly, it may today be impossible to know for certain what the original intention for the room was, or what, if anything, drove its design aesthetic. One of the best explanations, I think, comes from historian Matthew Bird, who posits that it was essentially an afterthought, and a gift from the building's architect to the bank president. A private bar and retreat exclusively for he and any chosen guests, lest we forget that the tower was designed and built during Prohibition. 
The thing that diners, train cars, and airship gondolas all have in common is that they're manufactured prefabricated buildings. In this case, no matter its intended purpose, a prefabricated room added on as an afterthought would almost certainly look like a prefabricated room added on as an afterthought. And so that's probably just what we have here. For almost as long as America has had tall buildings, we've also had airships and a strange fascination with bringing the two together. Especially in material from the first half of the 20th century, you almost can't see an artist's rendering of a proposed skyscraper without an image of an airship docked at the top. After the Hindenburg disaster in 1937, lighter-than-air travel was seen as dangerous and at best a frivolous novelty. But before that, it was a very real, futuristic, and forward-looking method of flight that had people rightly excited. Transatlantic travel in two days by airship versus four days by steamship was compelling on its own but the luxurious idea of floating among the clouds only added to the appeal. Although it's true that some architectural and design consideration was occasionally given to skyscraper-based airship moorings, the reality is that it was nearly all fiction. In the US, airships are, or at least were, almost always moored directly to the ground. In Europe, mooring towers actually were used, though only tall enough to reach the airship's attachment point and nothing approaching the height of a skyscraper. As skyscrapers with airship moorings go, only the Empire State Building actually came close. It legitimately was designed with a real, if not poorly conceived and under-engineered airship mooring and loading platform, above the 102nd floor observation deck. Look any deeper though, and it's obvious that the Empire State Building's airship mooring was just a weak premise to claim a tallest building record by asserting that the building was functionally rather than just ornamentally that tall. Consequently, the generic and undersized mooring was never practical enough to use, and the mooring clamps and winches were never even installed. In one single solitary instance, a small two-seater airship that we'd liken to today's Goodyear blimps tried unsuccessfully to dock with workers on the platform unable to pull in the ropes lacking the necessary equipment. In light of all of this, it's certainly fiction to think that the Industrial Trust Tower was ever intended or designed to have an airship docked to it. Being mostly decorative in nature, there isn't much structure contained in the lantern itself, something which would preclude it from ever becoming an airship mooring as actually constructed. An airship of size can exert a 50-ton or more horizontal pull on the mooring point, a tremendous amount of force that would easily rip most skyscrapers apart if not designed to contend with those stresses from the foundation up. The sheer size of airships was another limiting factor. Using the Hindenburg as an example, it was nearly twice as long as the Industrial Trust Building is tall at 804 feet versus 428 feet. Even a smaller airship like the Shenandoah at 680 feet is still ridiculous in proportion to the size of the building. And it doesn't take much to see that just one tall building with an airship mooring would preclude any similarly tall buildings within a significant radius. So what about Superman? Well, as we discussed earlier, similar Art Deco style buildings with stepped mass designs were a popular architectural addition to growing cities in the early 20th century. So it's no accident that a number of them throughout the US and Canada served as inspiration for the Daily Planet building as it appeared in the various permutations of the Superman franchise throughout the decades. By nearly all accounts, Providence's industrial trust tower was never one of them. Though the name still sticks around to this day because who doesn't want a Superman building in their own city? Although banks and financial institutions are constantly merging, changing, Changing, evolving, and moving, it's interesting to note that until the last remaining tenant moved out, the building had been continuously occupied by the Industrial National Bank or one of its descendants or acquirers for more than 80 years since its opening. Unfortunately though, there's a reason this episode is titled Superman's Dead. As iconic a part of the Providence skyline the tower and its beacon have been in the past, the future is not looking so bright for the Art Deco masterpiece. When Bank of America finally left in April 2013, the exterior lights were turned off. And although the beacon was still lit every night for a number of years, it too has darkened with time, leaving the former great giant to loom as a hulking dark mass over the city at night. As the building now sits vacant for approaching a decade, its physical condition has only worsened, and its deterioration only accelerated. The building's giant furnaces have ceased to operate, necessitating huge external boiler units and a network of pipes connected to the building as umbilical cords. All of this just to keep the building heated enough to sustain it while unoccupied. What's worse is that decades of exposure to the elements have not been kind to the building's limestone facade. Sealers applied at the time of construction to keep water from seeping into the stonework today prevent water that did make its way in from drying out. Water trapped in the stone through freeze and thaw cycles causes a phenomenon called spalling, where expansion during freezing causes chunks to fracture and flake off the surface like exfoliating skin. Scaffoldings and netting have been installed around the building and over the sidewalks to catch the constantly and unpredictably falling debris and protect pedestrians and cars below. But all of these things are bandages that only shore up problems for just so long. 
It's a cold, cruel reality, but to put it in car terms, the building is totaled. The cost to repair existing damage and rehab the building for modern uses would be significantly higher than demolishing it and putting up something newer and more cost-effective. As dire as that may sound, not all hope is necessarily lost, but it doesn't look good. Without going too far down a side road, around here, ever since the blizzard of 78, the slightest forecast for snow sends Rhode Islanders scurrying to clear store shelves of everyday necessities like milk, bread, and eggs ahead of the storm. Back in 2010, the state got involved in an objectively bad deal to bring a video game company here and it backfired, costing taxpayers a lot of money. Rhode Islanders have since been known to give increased scrutiny and opposition to any form of public expenditure. Already in 2017, Rhode Islanders balked at the idea of approving historic tax credits, which would have provided incentive for redevelopment of the building in the form of significantly reduced taxes over a long duration. Personally, I believe it's exactly that once bitten twice shy mindset, along with a weird sense of entitlement, that would later drive the Pawtucket Red Sox away in 2018. If we're not careful, we're going to lose what once was and could still be the jewel of Providence. We can't be so arrogant as to think that the building will be around forever just because enough people want it. That alone doesn't pay the extraordinary bills. In the meantime, without the attention it needs, the building becomes more and more of a target for urban explorers, and unfortunately, for vandalism. Not helping matters is the fact that the building's current owner, High Rock Development, filed for bankruptcy shortly after the deal to redevelop it fell through in 2017. And the latest proposal from another developer that same year actually for the first time put forth on paper the idea of demolishing the tower. If we're going to bring Superman back from the dead, it's going to take a lot of money, and that's going to mean some sort of public-private partnership. Without that, we can either knock it down ourselves or let time and nature do it. Maybe that seems harsh, or maybe that's just business even if it's the business of rehabbing the original business building for building business. Guys, thank you so much for watching today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to learn more about the Industrial Trust Tower, feel free to visit the links in the description to all of the various resources I've used when compiling this video. In particular, I invite you to check out area YouTuber CSRXN's 2019 video exploring the upper levels of the lantern, including breathtaking scenes outside the roof hatch at the very top. Some truly amazing video that with my fear of heights, I could never capture myself. I feel myself getting dizzy and my palms sweating just thinking about it. Lastly, I want to thank historian Matthew Bird, whose documented research proved invaluable to the creation of this episode. If you've gotten this far and haven't subscribed yet, just take a second to do it now. And one more time to all my new and existing subscribers, thank you. Don't forget, remembering and retelling Rhode Island history is important because Rhode Island history is our history. Thanks again for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. Hey everyone, Future Mark here in the editing room, and I have a bit of a breaking good news update for you. So it looks like the Superman building is about to get a few new tenants. Now, before you get too excited, you should know that it is only temporary. So something I definitely should have mentioned earlier but neglected to is the very cool fact that through a partnership involving the building owner and Cox Communications who provide the internet access, the Rhode Island Audubon Society is able to maintain a 24-7 webcam trained on this Peregrine Falcon nesting box atop the tower. Um, as luck would have it, uh, as I sit here on May 8th working to wrap up this video for the premiere in two days, uh, Mama Falcon has a clutch of eggs that appear to have just started hatching. Uh, the best part is you can watch this too. So at the moment, it looks like there's one chick hatched and one making its way out uh, and uh, two more on the way. Now these eggs were laid over a period of days, so it's not like they were ever all going to hatch at the same time. Uh, chances are pretty good that if you catch this video within the first week and head to the link below, uh, that you may actually get to see a chick hatch live. Uh, either way, you'll certainly be able to see uh, the cute baby chicks anytime over the course of the next month or so. Um, again, I've included a link to the Providence Peregrines webcam down in the description so you can go check it out for yourself uh, because nature is amazing. Uh, once more, if you guys enjoyed this video, then please take a second to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down and leave a comment below to tell me what you think. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and that's it. I'll see you next time.